Welcome to Memories of the Mizrach. BPY is so proud to present an oral history of the Jews of Arab lands. Our seventh graders have designed interview questions and they've interviewed people from different countries from all over the world who had experiences in the Arab lands and they spoke about their experiences as children, as youth, and as adults making the courageous transition, the courageous move, going from their homelands to America or to Israel. The Torah tells us at the end of Sefer Devarim, in Parashat Ha'azinu, She'al avi, avicha, ask your father, ask your parent, v'yagedcha, and he will tell you. The idea of turning to previous generations to get their wisdom, to get their inspiration is something that is inherently part of the fabric of the Jewish people. The story of the Mizrachiim, the story of the Jews who lived in the Near East, the Middle East, and who came in, in, a, in an inspired, courageous move to either get away from oppression or to find a better life, their story is our story. In this chair, you are about to see their stories. And we will be able, we will have the zechut to be able to learn from them, to take their stories, to be inspired, to give us courage, and to give us guidance as we all move ahead in our lives. Again, welcome to Memories of the Mizrach. My family came from uh, Tunisia. It's uh, Northern Africa, and uh, specifically from the island of Jerba. I speak Arabic, English, and Hebrew. My mother never spoke any other language except for Arabic. My family, when they anticipated that the state was gonna be created, they left Jerba, and they stayed in uh, Southern France in uh, uh, a disposed person's camp and there where I was born. There was a small little pogroms in 1948 when the State of Israel created in 67, but it was not as bad as other places. When the State of Israel was being uh, on the way, they already left to go there. They, they thought those were the days of the Moshiach. I know that the boat ride was a tough ride. I know that my sister was very sick on that trip and they didn't think she's going to make it. She lives in Yerushalayim now. I loved my life in Tzfat. It was hard because my mother had a lot of little kids and uh, food was not available all the time and we had to manage what we had. But life in Tzfat was very good in spite of all those hards things. Growing up, I had a lot of friends and they were similar to me. There were a lot of people who came from Jerba, there were other people who came from Morocco and uh, Hungarian Jews. We were all together there. The truth of the matter, everything was affected by Tunisia. The shul I went was a total Tunisian for many years. Every Thursday before Parashat Yitro, uh, we had a party and that was welcoming Yitro to the Jewish people because he would advise Moshe. Rosh Hodesh Nisan will get all kinds of grains with olive oil and my mother will take a key and turn it and hop, hopping for uh, the open lock for the new year because Rosh Hodesh Nisan uh, one of the new years. Also on Shavuot, my mother would bake. I still remember all the baking that my mother did for Shavuot. Leathers, which resemble going to Mount Sinai, picking the Torah. Uh, baskets of either taking the Torah or the Bikurim to Beit HaMikdash. But everything was connected to, to, the, to the Bible, to the Jewish life. Lela Seder comes to mind. Uh, I remember in my house, in my parents' house in Tzfat, we all sat on the floor 
on a big rug and there was a, a very low table but uh, we used to have uh, our family and my mother's brother came with the skits usually and the, the Lela Seder was uh, done in Hebrew and in Arabic. My wife is from West Hartford, Connecticut. After college, she went to Israel to volunteer to teach English to, as a second language. I met her there and uh, got married here and I went back there, lived there for uh, seven, eight years. And then 40 years ago, I came here for 10 months and 40 years later, I'm still here. Yom Kippur, I went a break from shul. At that time, I was married for a year. I saw airplanes up there, and I think in the evening I got an uh, emergency call. Went the next day to my base, which was a mess, really, because they were not ready, and we drove to the Golan. I was in communication, listening and giving, getting some uh, orders, and transferring them and we went up there. We stayed there for 150 days in the Golan. We reached the, the enclave, the Syrian enclave. That's where we ended the war. She said the most important thing for us is Shabbat, Israel, and the Jewish customs. Those are the three things that are really, uh, will sustain us forever. And that's, I'll, I'll give the credit to my daughter, <laughs> Naomi. Well, I love everything I see about them. Every time I visit, they show me things that they did in school. And it's connected either the holidays or Shabbat or similar thing. I left Sudan when I was two years old. My mother's family is originally from Syria. My father's family was originally from Morocco. My great-grandfather went from Morocco. He went to yeshiva in Tveria. When he was in Tveria, that's when they asked him to come uh, to Sudan, create a base in. He was the rabbi, the mohel, the shochet. Uh, there was only one shul and they got along famously with, with the local population. In fact, when my great-grandfather passed, the Muslim and the Catholic cleric, they joined in his funeral. They, they had great deals of respect. My father was the grandfather, I was the grandson of the chief rabbi, and through various contexts, he was asked to assist the Eitzel, the Lechi, and at a time when Yitzhak Shamir and Yaakov Meridor had to escape from Israel, because at that time it was Palestine and the British were after him, uh, he would come into either Eritrea or into Sudan and my father would help him take refuge in one of his warehouses and my mother would cook for him at that time. For that reason, uh, my parents were honored with the naming of a street in Israel. Once the state of Israel was declared its independence in 1948, in most Arab countries, including the Sudan, things got problematic for the Jews. Every movement, transactions were monitored. And as a result of it, my parents felt it was time for us to leave. Other families started to leave in various ways. We were not able to sell our home. We had left our home in place and my aunt and uncle moved in to our home for a period of time. And soon thereafter, they left as well. My family prepared an invitation to an alleged aunt who was getting married, but it wasn't true. We showed it to the government and they allowed us to depart. I left with my mom and all my siblings at the time. My dad did not depart with the family. He traveled to Europe and then from Europe he traveled to America as he felt it would be suspicious if we all left at the same time. We had help in the house and the help saw that we were packing um, important things and they recognized that we were departing for good. And they were very kind in keeping the news from the government and from the police. And they were told and subsequently 
the headmaster in the house, he was given the house after my aunt and uncle left. When we came to America, um, family was living in Union City, New Jersey, and we took an apartment in Union City, New Jersey. Our relatives were there. We joined the shul. It was Rabbi Hirschman at that time, Temple Israel Emmanuel, and they hadn't seen too many Sephardim in their life, so it was unique. Soon thereafter, we, uh, we moved up to North Bergen, New Jersey, and essentially that's where I grew up. The communities, both Temple Israel Emmanuel and Congregation Beth Abraham, were very kind in allowing my parents, my father, to have a Sephardic minion specifically for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur where the davening is very, very different. So I had a sister with special needs. I remember the day we went and we were sworn in as American citizens and fortunately there was a Jewish judge um, and she put Debbie right through whereas sometimes people at that time were rejected from coming into the country if they had special uh, needs. For the most part my mother's family had left before we did, and they helped us significantly to prepare a place to stay, and, and we lived amongst them and in the same apartment complex. We, in turn, helped my father's family, who left after we did, um, help them acclimate to America with a place to live and, um, and to help them gain uh, employment as well. As a result of the trials and tribulations that my family had to go through, to get to America and be able to observe religious freedom, the message that I'd like to give to both my children and grandchildren is to persevere, to understand where you come from, understand who we are, all Jews, Ashkenazic Jews, Sephardic Jews, stay together and always help each other. That's what my family was all Please continue in the same way we have continued to be very, very steadfast and close to your Jewish community and be as helpful as you can and continue to learn Torah forever. My name is Nissan Latani. I born in 1954 in Iran. The life in Iran was, for the Jews, was very good. We, we lived among the non-Jews, but the relationship with the Jews and non-Jews was very good at that time. It was the time of the Shah. At the time that we lived there, we had probably between 65 to 70,000 Jews living in Iran. I live in a it's called Iraq, Iran. Okay, not to be stuck with Iraq. <laughs> we lived in my grandfather's house, and our house was always open. It was open to whoever passed through the town could come and stay, and they feed him. They were staying there sometime for days until they go to their journey. And this tradition, we kept it also by us. We moved in 1963 to Israel, and in that time, things it start changing with the Jews, some anti-Semitic here and there. And also from Israel, the Aliyah community was coming every time there and they're trying to talk to you to leave to Israel. Also, the Shah, he was so good to the Jews that he was encouraging Jews, go back, if you want to go back to, your, to Israel, to your homeland, you could go, you could take all your belonging, no restriction, just go. When we decide to move to Israel, so the way it, the way it conduct, so you take all your belonging, what you want to take with you and what you have, and then they take you to Tehran, it's close to the airport. They had a camp, like a camp, they had a big place, and you had to stay there for three months. When they were ready also, we took the bus to the airport and we came to, to Israel. I was nine years old when I moved to Israel. When we moved to Israel, we were we are six people, six uh, six siblings, and my parents are eight. And we took with us also my grandfather, my father's father and father mother, Yikutiel and Tzipora. We lived in Ashdod. We got apartment in Israel 
500 square feet, one bedroom. With all those hard things that we had, we were happy. We took it as a something special and, and we managed. I worked in Ashdod until 1979. In 1979, I moved, I came to America for a tour. For a while I was here, then I met a friend that he came during Khomeini, that they had to escape. He introduced me, my wife. The right away we connect together. After two years, we got married. And then I had a beautiful daughter and a beautiful son. And then I have all these beautiful grandkids. This is my advice to your kids. First of all, you have to be patient. You have to have a lot of patience. You have to listen to people. You listen to people when they talk to you, try to express themselves, try to understand what they want from you, what they, what's their meaning. Always don't hold grudge. Let the things go, even it's big things, it's a, even it costs money. Just don't hold it, just let it go. Always be nice to other people, try to help other people. Keep the Jewish tradition, keep going with the, all the halachot and all the things that you learn in school. I was born in 1938. When I was born, I lived in Cairo, Egypt, with my parents. I am the youngest of six children. Where we lived in Cairo, there were many synagogues. And from history, we were told that Yosef was there in these places, Rambam, the Rambam Synagogue. It was about 80 to 90,000. And now there is hardly maybe three to four people left. When we lived in Egypt, the Jews, we were happy. We were free. We were very friendly with our neighbors. They used to come visit us in our house. It was a good life until the war started. When the Sinai War in 1956 came, it was actually the end of our freedom in Egypt. It started in 1948 when Israel was proclaimed the state of Israel. We the Jews were very happy, but the government was not happy. They started to mistreat, to beat up people in the street, to take away businesses from the Jews. They were all of a sudden Every good relationship that we had with them turned sour. We were not, they were not friendly to us anymore. I lived in Egypt until 1957, when two policemen came to our door and asked my mother, where is Alice? My mother told them, Alice, she's the, a ba the youngest, the baby, what do you want from her? She has to leave Egypt in one week. Because I, at one time, I went with my older sister to take a picture for her to get an exit visa. My sister was member of the Bnei Akiva group. I was thrown out of Cairo. That's when I left. In my time, I didn't know the word anti-Semitism. But, but then I knew that our neighbors, our, the people who used to be our friends were not our friends anymore. All of a sudden, they turned against us and they were saying it very clearly, leave, we don't want you here. When I was told to leave in one week, it was a trauma time. I didn't know where to go what to take with me, how much money. Anyway, we were not allowed to take more than something like $20, not more. 
only one suitcase, how much can you take in one week? How much can you plan? And I went to Alexandria on a boat called the Lydia. It was a Greek boat. The Jewish organization called the Hayas. The word Hayas means Hebrew Immigration Aid Society. They helped the Jews at that time. They helped a lot. I went on that boat for two weeks. I ended up in Marseille. Marseille is a, a place in France. As many Jews from Egypt who left, they took us to one place, to one big, large room, all together, sleeping on cots. We had no money, we had nothing, but the highest did help us. From France, I, myself, I had to go on another boat, the Theodor Herzl, that took me and the other Jews who went on to Namal Haifa, to the port of Haifa. And uh, we all ended up in Israel at that time, not knowing where we're going, what we're going to do, where is the next meal coming from. It was a very difficult time, especially for me, being alone without my parents. I lived in Israel for two years at that time. Israel was the, a small country at that time, the beginning. It was very difficult. I didn't speak Hebrew at that time, but I learned it very fast. I worked in an office, in a restaurant, in different places. And then my parents let me know that they had arrived to Paris in France, waiting for the visa to come to the United States. So I traveled to Paris we lived in Paris in a hotel on the fifth floor for a year and a half until we received the entry visa to come to the United States. We had family already in the United States and the family helped us a lot. In 1990, when we were in Cairo, we went back to the house where I used to live and there was one woman who used to live in the basement in our building and she hugged me and kissed me and said, oh, you want to see your apartment where you used to live? The pictures of my parents were still on the wall. The furniture as is. When I went to visit my house, I did not want to take anything anymore that's Egyptian. They can have it. We are very happy that we left Egypt. We had a chance to come to America to get an education, to live a free life. And I don't wish for anybody, any of you, of my children, of the future generation to go through war. We hope and we wish and we pray for shalom, for peace. We should all live together in good friendship. No more war. My mother uh, was born in a, in a city called Mogador. My father came from a city called uh, Tadla. And he came to Casablanca where, where he, he built uh, a shul, a big shul, a mikvah. I went there uh, with my brother after many years. And in, in that time, there was still some Sifre Torah in the shul. So we took them out uh, and he took one to Paris because he, my brother lived in Paris in that time. My son, Jack, my oldest son, he took care of it and he made sure that it, it's, uh, they kosher it, they checked it. And then we sent it to Eris Israel. We spoke Arabic and French because Morocco was under uh, the French uh, protector. We were very close, very close, neat community. A lot of tradition in Morocco, all the holidays. 
and in, in, in Morocco you, you would feel a Jewish holiday more than you would feel it or as much as you feel it in Israel. For example, uh, sukkahs. Most of the sukkahs that we, we used to build, it was from palm, palm trees. They used to buy a palm tree and the Arabs would bring it to, to us, to the house. So you could see every day going with the schlepping uh, palm trees to, to the house and shopping uh, for the holidays and preparing a lot of, of traditional foods. You could feel the atmosphere, the, the Yiddish kite over, over there. And it was very, very pleasant. And the Arabs, they used to, to do whatever we want, wanted. They were very nice to us because we employed them. But you have to be careful. Uh, my family would not let me out and go by myself outside because there were Arabs coming in. It's not, it's not only for Jews. But it was safe, it was, it was good. I didn't see any problems in Morocco or anything. Uh, uh, we used to have friends, we used to have neighbors, we were very close, very close-knit. The life was, uh, was quite pleasant in Morocco, even today it's pleasant. It, it, uh, the Arabs are very friendly, even with the conflict that's going on in Israel. They never uh, uh, bothered the, the Jews, they still questioning why we left. You know, they would like us to go back. Before I came to America, I went to England, to Yeshiva. Some people came from Yeshiva in London and they recruited some of the kids to send to, send to England. My mother wasn't so thrilled to let me go. You know, I was her youngest. Yeshiva was very good for me. You know, we learned a lot of things. My first experience, it was a Friday. I was 13 years old. The first meal that they served us was gefilte fish. And I never saw gefilte fish in my life. And then I tasted it and I couldn't swallow it and I started to cry. <laughs> it wasn't a, a big yeshiva. We had maybe uh, 50, 60 people, that's it. And the, 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 the kids from Morocco, there were maybe 30, 30 kids. My friend who, who I traveled with from Morocco, to London, we, we went by, by ship. And after, after England, where I was there for about five and a half years, I came to Lake Wodishivo. I was there for many years. And that's how I ended up in the United States. After that, I, I came over here. I have met my beautiful wife. <laughs> I have a beautiful family, a beautiful grandchild. So it was, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. You have to be uh, very much positive, or, even though you, you could have some difficult sometimes, but there is always light on the, on the, on the other side. And uh, you have to have a lot of hope. And the best thing is to make good friends and be good. When you have good friends and you have a good name, you go a lot of places. It's very hard to, to describe the joy that I have. My grandkids and my family here. My mother used to bless us all the time. And I believe that all the blessings that my mother blessed me happened. And here they are. My name is Carmi Israel Mizrahi and uh, my parents came to Israel from Baghdad. When my father left Baghdad, I think in 1932, he was about 25 years old and my mother was about 20 years old. They came to Israel in 1932. My father's father his name was Mashiach. He was a big rabbi in Baghdad. There were seven big rabbis, he was one of them. 
and he was working with the with the Benish Chai. The Benish Chai, I don't know if you heard about him, was he's very, very big rabbi. He wrote like 120 books. Only 80 of them were published so far. They were studying Chavruta in the shul, and they had a big shul, big shul in Baghdad was 30,000 people. And in, in Baghdad, in Iraq, there was not even one mixed marriage. All the Jews stay together, they make sure they stay together. Unfortunately, he was killed by the, by the Muslim regime. The Muslims were not nice to Jewish people, that's the least to say. He had to sell everything he has, he had to buy a gold coin. That's everything he had. And he, had, he made a belt and put it on his stomach with a gold coin. And you have to travel with taxi, with horse and buggy, with planes. And you have to go to a lot of cross point. And when you get to a cross point, you have to have a passport. Many times, they didn't want to let him go through. He told me he used to put money inside the passport and hand him the passport and they'd stamp it so he can continue going through. He was, uh, Hashem helped him, of course. The journey from Baghdad to Israel at that time I believe is very dangerous because it wasn't like today. There were all kinds of robbers and muggles and you go to the desert and you go to no man land. I think my father had a lot of Seattle Dishmaya because he was always doing uh, keep Shabbat all his time and he did the right thing with Hashem. So I think he had a big protection from Hashem, so he managed to go through all those uh, checkpoints and pass through Israel. We lived in Tel Aviv most of the time, in different places in Tel Aviv, mostly in the south at that time. Then in Israel, he built a big house, like 20 apartment house with his brother-in-law. Till one day, the Arab decided to have a pogrom again, and they came from Jaffa to Tel Aviv. And they were shooting and looting and burning, so all his tenants ran away. And he didn't have uh, rent money to pay the mortgage, so he lost that. And I joined the army. I joined Sayeret Egoz. Uh, it was very hard training. After a while, they, they removed me out of there because they need soldiers in technical, uh, in, the, in, in the Air Force. And I had a back, uh, technical background, so they, I, they got me out of there and I moved to the, I was in the Air Force for six years. This mess, the special message that I would like to leave for future generation is that you have to know one very, 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 very important thing. Hashem is always with us. For the last three and a half thousand years, everybody tried to get us. We're still here, they're not here. You have to trust Hashem, you have to pray to Hashem, you always have to ask Hashem to look after us, to look after the Jewish people, and uh, to have faith, and to know, it's more than faith, you have to know that Hashem is there for you. Hashem is taking care of us to make sure we have a, a continued generation, uh, that kids that study Torah, and uh, do what Hashem wants us to do, and uh, until Mashiach come, we're going to continue Bezrat Hashem, and that's what it means. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you have seen inspired and inspiring stories. These stories are stories of the Jewish people who left their lands to make a new life for their families, and in so doing, they enhanced and enriched all of our lives. But there's also another part, another ending to this story. There are still remnants of Jewish communities, strongholds of Jewish communities in the lands of the, of the Mizrach. We are fortunate to be able to see now, as an epilogue to memories of the Mizrach, the story of someone, Shalia, who's going to tell us about a present day Jewish community in Tunisia, because the stories of memories of the Mizrach still continue, and they still enable us to learn, and again, to be inspired. Welcome to Shalia's story as an epilogue.
שמי שליה, שליה חדד, נשואה לאוזן, בעלי אבי אוזן. אם לשמונה ילדים שיהיו בריאים. נולדתי בג'רבה, ג'רבה בשבתוניס. אנחנו מהשורשים מג'רבה, גם אבא, גם סבא, אני מורה, אבל כמורה, לא מורה בשביל פרנסה. בשבת, יום שישי, כל הקהילה מתארגנת לשבת, ויש כמו טבול, טבול כזה, זה שכונתי, קהילתי, שכל הקהילה מביאה את החלות שלה של השבת, ושל החמין שלה ערב שבת. לכבוד שבת, זה נפתח ביום שישי לעשות בשביל השבת. אנחנו חברים עם הערבים. אנחנו גרים שכנים, הולכים לקניות אצל ערבים, עובדים עם ערבים גם, אבל נגיד אם, אם יהודי יפתח עסק פה, זה לא, הוא לא יצליח בעסק, כי אנחנו במדינה ערבית, מי יקנה אצל יהודי? הממשלה. ממש שומרת עלינו, הבנת? שומרת על הקהילה היהודית פה. גם מהאינטרסים של הממשלה, כי, הממשל, כי, ה, כי הקהילה פה היהודית נקודה חשובה לתיירות של תוניס. יש לנו, החלום שלנו לעלות, או רוצים לעלות, אבל זה קשה, הבנת? אנחנו חיים בשקט פה, השורשים שלנו פה, המשפחה פה. אז הצעד, קשה לנו לעשות צעד כזה, הבנתי? זה קשה ל... יש, כולם, כולם רוצים. פה אני, אני, אני אספר משהו על הקהילה, שבאמת, זה היה במלחמת העולם השנייה, במלחמת העולם השנייה, בשבת, שבת פרשת תרומה, הגיעו הנאזים, מה שאמרנו לקהילה היהודית פה בג'בה, וביקשו מהיהודים 50 קילו זהב. אז צריך, הם, הם הגיעו ב, 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 בשבת בבוקר, אמרו להם, יש לכם עד הערב, עד מוצאי שבת, עד, עד מנחה, עד מנחה. אם לא נמצא 50 קילו זהב, אז אנחנו נפוצץ את כל הקהילה. אז הרב באותו זמן, זה הרב חלפון הכהן, הוא רצה לי כאן בשביל ברכה. אז התחיל לאסוף מכל הבתים את כל הזהב, אמר לכל היהודים, צריך, מי שיש עיר, נגיד עגיל או משהו זהב בבית, זה יהיה לו כמו עבודה זרה. הבנת? שכל היהודים יתחילו ל- 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 להוציא את כל הזהב שלהם. הלך גם, ל- הלך באוטו בשבת, ו- וכדי לאסוף, וזה פיקוח נפש, הלך לאסוף את, ה- את הזהב. עד הערב הם אספו רק, אני יודעת, 40 קילו, לא, לא אספו 40, 50. אז ערבבו את זה עם נחושת, שיהיו 50 קילו, שכשיגיעו הנאזים הם ייתנו להם זה, כאילו, מעורב עם נחושת ועם כסף, ש... שלא פחדו, זה, זה... אם, לא, אם לא יביאו 50 קילו, אז כל הקהילה הולכת לאיבוד. הנאזים, סליחה, הנאזים הגיעו לבית הכנסת וביקשו ונתנו להם את הזהב והרב באותו זמן, כשיצאו הנאזים, קילל אותם, קילל אותם כאילו ש... שלא, שלא תגיעו למחוס חפציהם, לא עם הזהב ולא, ש... ש... תלכו ואין חזרה, הבנת? אז כן וכן היה, הנאזים מאותה, מאותה שבת הם התחילו לסגת, כאילו הבריטים התחילו להשתלט על הנאזים בבריטן... ב... בגרמניה וזה, אז התחילו לסגת. הלכו ולא חזרו. והקהילה לא ניזוקה בכלום, וברוך השם כולם, כולם כאילו ניצלו בנס. המסר, שלא כמורה, כיהודייה, זה אהבת חינם. רק אהבת חינם. אהבת עם ישראל ואהבת חינם, זה משהו מיוחד לעם ישראל. זה שאנחנו אוהבים את אחד, את היהודי שהוא רחוק ממנו, ממנה, שאנחנו לא מכירים אותו, זה בגלל שהוא יהודי, אנחנו אוהבים אותו, אהבת חינם זה הניצחון של עם ישראל.